It's easy and fun to compare the Cold War arms race to a childish contest between NATO and the Communist bloc, in which they one up to each other in developing long and hardened metal contraptions designed to swiftly penetrate enemy defenses before spewing forth their payloads. But the military industrial complexes of both contenders were not just in it for the lulls, oh no. As a general rule of thumb, if a country's military sets aside a sizable chunk of budget to develop a new vehicle or weapon system, it is because they need to fulfill a specific tactical, operational, or strategic goal and or counter some potential threat. In the late 1950s, the Soviet Navy had a very clear threat in mind. NATO's attack submarines, which at the time mainly outpaced their slower Soviet counterparts. Thus, the planner's goal was to develop a nuclear-powered sub that could outrun and outmaneuver all of its rivals both underwater and on the surface. The ultimate goal here? The interception and destruction of them. In other words, the new vessel would serve an anti-submarine warfare purpose, or ASW. This was the initial spark for the development of a new concept and class of Soviet vessels, the Project 705 Lira, or Alpha Class, the fastest submarines ever built. It was a pretty tall order, so much so that two facilities were assigned the job. The Malakit and Volna Design Bureaus, also known as Bureau 16 and Bureau 143, respectively. The Malakit engineers were particularly suited for the task, as they had built the first ever Soviet nuclear sub, the Lenensky Komsomol. Work began in 1958 when the designers laid out the concept for their new ASW vessel. To outclass the NATO subs, it had to run at a speed of at least 40 knots, which is 46 miles per hour or 74 kilometers per hour. By comparison, the Skipjack class of US nuclear submarines introduced in 1959 boasted a submerged speed of 33 knots, considered unprecedented for the time. And to achieve that speed, the designer's main concern was to reduce the sub's mass to a maximum of 1,500 tons. Weight could be reduced by employing a single reactor and by installing highly automated control functions which allow for the reduction of crew to just nine officers and three warrant officers. But that wasn't enough. The designer's next idea was to reconsider the hull. Instead of fitting a standard double hull made of steel, they opted for a single hull made of a titanium alloy. Not only is this metal 33% lighter than steel, but it's also stronger, which would allow the hull to withstand great greater pressures without gaining weight. As such, the new submarine concept would run faster and deeper than its enemies. The titanium alloy would also withstand explosions better than steel, and as an added bonus, it would be non-magnetic, decreasing the chances of it being spotted via magnetic anomaly detection. Deployment work started in early 1959 as the Admiral Yard in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Very soon, engineers realized that delivering a 1,500-ton submarine would be impossible. The Navy didn't like the idea of a single hull, not even if it was cast in titanium. As the future subs would be deployed in the near freezing Arctic waters, military procurement insisted for a double hull which would be more reliable. Next, the design bureaus realized that automation technology was not really up to their standards yet, and therefore many functions had to be reverted to a manual setup. Twelve more than doubled to twenty-seven, requiring more space and kit for the living quarters. It became evident very soon that to achieve the desired technical reliability, designers had to account for a larger bulk. And then there was the question of how are they going to bring the weight down? Designers thought about reducing the shielding of the nuclear power plants, which would cause some risks as the nuclear power plant produced polonium-210, a highly radioactive isotope. Eventually, though, the design bureau realized that they could not bring the overall mass below the 2300 ton mark, which was still good enough, but even achieving that target implied some major engineering wizardry. In this case, engineers experimented with ingenious ways to bring down the weight of the reactor and its cooling system. All the while, the construction process of the first Project 705 prototype uh, was being kept secret, as you might expect. But by 1969, the citizens of Leningrad, who took a stroll along the Neva River, could easily take a peek at the sleek, elegant, modern, and relatively small submarine. The same view could be observed from Earth's orbit, where one of the CIA satellites pointed its camera toward the Leningrad shipyards. The photos landed on the desk of her Lord, an experienced U.S. naval intelligence analyst, Lord speculated that the Soviets were developing a new class of nuclear-powered submarine. Given the size of the prototype on the Neva, Lord inferred that it would likely be faster than anything the U.S. and NATO had on offer. Moreover, the analyst noted that the Leningrad shipyard was connected by an island waterway to another facility in Severodvinsk, suggesting a large and well-financed project. Subsequent photos worried Lord even more, and they showed a hull section to be highly reflective. The analyst was puzzled as a steel hull would normally not reflect light that much. 
perhaps it could be titanium. So fellow analysts laughed off that idea, as they were convinced that the Soviets did not have the capability to weld titanium. Besides, a titanium alloy would likely dissolve in seawater. Other CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency analysts agreed with Lord, as they had been suspecting that the Soviet shipbuilding industry had been researching the use of the metal for at least a decade. Lord eventually joined forces with CIA agent Gerhard Pham, who collected a sizable number of human intelligence reports, which confirmed that the Soviet Navy was indeed serious about titanium. They also learned that the new class of subs would employ small crews, a further clue that the Soviets were aiming for speed above all. Lord and Pham's analysis was confirmed in April 1969, when the Admiral Yards at Leningrad launched the first in the new class of nuclear submarines. In the Soviet Union, they were collectively known as Project 705 Lira submarines, although they came in two variants, the 705 and the 705K. NATO militaries simply refer to them as the Alpha Class. The Soviet shipyards assembled a total of four 705 subs and three 705Ks. Their characteristics were largely similar, so we'll focus on the specs of the 705s without the K. Each was 84.1 meters long, 10 meters wide, and 7.6 meters high. It was relatively light, displacing 2,300 tons on the surface and 3,180 tons when submerged. This latter weight is equivalent to approximately 30 blue whales, by the way, you're welcome. Speaking of which, if a 705 and a blue whale were to have a diving competition, the sea mammal would be victorious, as their average diving depth is 460 meters or 1500 feet, compared to the subs 420 meters or 1380 feet. But those arrogant whales will be forced to eat humble krill after a speed race, while a blue whale can swim at a top speed of 17.3 knots, a 705 sub would totally outpace it, whizzing by at 41 knots. And now you might be wondering why we are comparing a nuclear vessel to a whale. We actually have a good reason, we'll get to it later. The record-breaking speed of each Lyra class sub was ensured by its nuclear reactor. 705s were fitted with an OK-550 model, while the 705Ks had a BM-40A. In both cases, the output was the same, 155 megawatts or 40,000 horsepower. That's a nice kick up the aft section for sure, but these types of reactors need cooling, and cooling systems take up space and add to the mass of the submarine. And the more mass, well, the less speed. Standard, burdensome cooling systems relied on water, but the Soviet engineers a bit of an ingenious solution. They would use liquid metal as a coolant, more specifically, a lead bismuth alloy. As for the human elements, the Lyra or Alpha class subs would employ a crew of just 30 to 32, all of them officers and warrant officers. By comparison, NATO submarines were manned by about 100 personnel. This relatively small crew had at their disposal a control room fitted with state-of-the-art equipment, such as an integrated detection system which included the Kerch sonar to spot active targets and the Zugut sonar for mine avoidance. The helmsman would control the vessel's movements by using two joysticks standing alongside an engineer in charge of the pumps and air systems. The engineer also had sight of the sub's unmanned compartments via an advanced closed-circuit TV system. To further complement this futuristic kit, the 705s would be the first Soviet submarines to be equipped with the Accord a computer-based control system integrating data from the sonars with the numerous weapons on board, which included VA-111 Schickval torpedoes, 81R anti-submarine missiles, MG-84 torpedo decoys, and PMT-1 mine torpedoes. The Accord system would automate the identification and engagement of up to three simultaneous targets in rapid sequence. All in all, the Project Lyra subs definitely presented some advantages which made them stand out against their Soviet predecessors, as well as their NATO rivals. First of all, let's talk about some aspects of crew safety. As mentioned earlier, the 32 personnel on board would operate inside the central compartment of the vessel. The weapons were housed in the forward section and operated by a highly automated system. The nuclear reactor, instead, was located in the aft section. Now, the crew could move anywhere during periods of rest, but during operations, the three sections could be sealed off from each other. This means that if the forward or aft segments were damaged in battle, the design would improve chances of crew survival. But if a 705 were to receive a critical hit, the personnel on board could easily fit into its rescue sphere, uh, which could be detached from its main body and rise to the surface as a lifeboat. But the key selling points of the Lyra class was its speed. NATO observers, in fact, considered them the fastest submarines in the world, although that honor actually belonged to a single Soviet prototype known as K-222, which never progressed beyond that stage. The speed was achieved thanks to the innovative titanium hull and the unique design of the liquid metal-cooled nuclear reactors. But the same ingredients provided another great advantage, 
depth, the Liras could withstand greater pressure than NATO submarines and thus run much deeper. The 705s could thus sit below the range of NATO weapons while launching their own torpedoes and missiles. But even if within range, the Soviet subs had another advantage. A reserve buoyancy of around 30% versus an average of 11% compared to NATO vessels. Reserve buoyancy is used as a measure of a ship's ability to sustain damage. In this case, it allowed the 705 to change direction and depth very quickly, uh, making them a very agile target. This range of features made NATO navies very, very nervous, so much so that they rushed to develop some effective countermeasures such as the American Mark 48 ADCAP and the British Spearfish, two heavy torpedoes which could reach speeds of up to 80 knots. The 705 submarines, however, were far from perfect naval weapons and they were marred by several drawbacks. First of all, they were bloody noisy. Some of the noisiest subs launched by the USSR, in fact, which made them very easy to identify from a distance. And one may wonder, well, What's the point of a noisy submarine if they're supposed to conduct stealthy missions? Well, lucky for the crews, this defect was partially offset by the ability to dive at great depths. Another con was the cost. Titanium alloy made for a fast and durable hull, certainly, but it was almost five times more expensive than steel. Working with titanium proved to be also a massive headache for the Soviet shipyards, as welders had to work in special warehouses filled with argon gas, and they were sealed hermetically. This complex method increased the chance of mistakes, and apparently the 705's hulls were prone to cracking. But the main flaws of the Lyra slash Alpha class subs were related to the nuclear reactors and their cooling system. As described in a 2002 paper by the Non-Proliferation Review, the nuclear reactors in the 705s had to be kept at temperatures above 123 degrees Celsius, lest the liquid lead bismuth coolant solidified. If it did harden, so did the nuclear fuel within the core. And if the core froze, it would have been impossible to restart the reactor. The implied consequence was that if a Project Lyra submarine were left inactive for too long, the reactor would just die. To address the risk, the Soviet Navy set up a dedicated maintenance facility at Sapadna Lifts, a submarine base overlooking the Barents Sea. This facility's main job was to deliver superheated steam to the reactors of the moored 705s, thus keeping the core and coolants at just the right temperature. This method proved to be expensive and unreliable as the facility was prone to breakdowns. The only option left to the Navy uh, was to keep the reactors running continuously, uh, which meant that the submarines had to be kept manned at all times. Now, the problem with having nuclear powered reactors constantly on is that their cores generate neutrons, which interact with atoms of the bismuth 209 isotope contained in the coolant. The result of this interaction was bismuth 210, which then degenerated into polonium 210. According to the CDC, polonium-210 emits alpha particles which carry high amounts of energy that can damage or destroy genetic material and cells inside the body. Breathing or eating large quantities in a fairly short period of time can cause radiation exposure of internal organs. This can result in serious medical symptoms or death. End quote. The Soviet sailors clearly were not in danger of ingesting the harmful isotope, but would likely breathe it in during lengthy missions at sea, constituting an ever-present medical hazard. The first 705 to be completed was the K-64. It launched on April 2nd, 1969, was commissioned on December 31st, 1971, and then entrusted to Captain A.S. Pushkin. Captain Pushkin took K-64 for a spin in early 1972, or more correctly, a series of trials in the Barents Sea. During one of these test runs, the reactor experienced a breach, and the lead bismuth coolant leaked into the outside compartment. The spill in itself provoked some damage on its own, but what was worse is that it caused the coolant to solidify permanently backing up the reactor. It was a total loss. K-64 had to be dismantled and the reactor compartment was filled with furfural and bitumen to block radiation. The entire engine block was then shipped to the other side of the Navarre Zemler Islands, where it was unceremoniously dumped in the Kara Sea. But just in that year, Moscow had signed the 1972 London Convention, which prevented the disposal of radioactive debris at sea. According to the Non-Proliferation Review, the failed engine of the K-64 was eventually stored on the shores of Gremica Bay. This setback, though, it didn't deter the Soviet Navy, and six further subs, three 705s and three 705Ks, were commissioned between December 1977 and December 1981. The operational history of the Alpha-class submarines was largely unremarkable, as they never saw combat. We may argue that their mere existence, however, worried NATO enough for the US and the UK to develop new and faster types of torpedoes, as mentioned earlier. Vessels K-373 and K-316 experienced no issues during their time in service. They were eventually decommissioned in 1990, 
Party and dismantled in 1994. KA-493 survived the fall of the Soviet Union, serving with the Russian Navy until 1995, when it was refitted with a water-cooled BM-4 reactor. After the brief servicing hiatus, it re-entered duty as a training vessel before its eventual decommissioning in 1996 and dismantling in 1997. The remaining three Lyra submarines had a somewhat more troubled history. K-123 was launched on December 26, 1977, and then experienced a major accident in 1982 when a lead bismuth spill contaminated the entire reactor compartment. It took the Navy almost nine years to replace the compartment, but the sub took to the seas again in 1991, now numbered B-123. It ceased its operations in 1993 and then was decommissioned in 1995. According to the Non-Proliferation Review again, also K-463 experienced a reactor accident, although no details are available. The damage was irreparable, and K-463 was decommissioned in 1986. So that leaves us with the sixth vessel, K-432. No react faults for this one, but a fate far more unpredictable. Quoting again from the Non-Proliferation Review. In a freak accident, the submarine hit a whale during its sea trials, necessitating major repairs that were completed in 1988. However, the submarine was never recommissioned. By 1996, all seven Project 705 Lyra or Alpha class submarines had been decommissioned and were all undergoing their dismantling. The physical breakdown of a titanium hull nuclear powered submarine is a complex and delicate affair, and the Russian Navy and its contractors had to follow a meticulous process. First, subs had to be relocated to a specialized facility, the Sevmar shipyard in Severodinsk. There, all weapons, explosives, and sensitive equipment were removed by the Navy and reassigned to other units. Next, contractors stripped the vessel of loose furnishings spare parts, tools, and other expendable material. Once a sub was dry docked, specialized personnel would open the hull about the reactor and move on to the most dangerous phase, removing the radioactive fuel from the core. This hazardous cargo would be temporarily stored at the shipyard before being transported to an external facility for it to be reprocessed. As for the titanium hull, it would be recycled and sold as scrap metal. In the Navy's calculations, the revenue from such sales should have covered the overall cost of the dismantling process. In reality, the advanced equipment required to defuel the reactors and strip the titanium hull largely offset those proceeds, meaning that the Sevmar shipyards lost about $2.5 million per submarine in the late 1990s, almost $5 million each in 2024 value. The Project 705 Lyra class of submarines were definitely a source of concern for NATO navies. Even at the developmental stage, they kept DIA and CIA analysts busy collecting human and satellite intelligence. And once launched, they proved to the West that the Soviet Union had the right skills and resources to pull off what was believed almost impossible, i.e. developing small, highly automated titanium-hulled vessels which could be run by a nimble crew. That fact in itself spurred the US and the UK to develop suitable weapons that could counter the 705s. In terms of practical results, however, the boat had little to brag about. Four out of the seven vessels experienced serious accidents, which put them out of commission almost immediately. Moreover, even those subs which functioned as intended were marred by complex and costly maintenance processes, which hardly justified the enormous investment. The effort poured into the 705s by the Soviet Navy was not to be entirely lost, though. If considered as an intermediate phase or a stepping stone, Project Lyra enabled Soviet shipyards to perfect welding practices, propulsion systems, and automated control equipment, which trickled down into future designs, such as the Akula class. As long as the Cold War was on, NATO navies would still be wary of the Red Menace from the Deep. <laughs>